I want to start out by asking you a question. I want you to think about when is the last time that you had a moment in your life where you said to yourself, you know what? I am not as young as I used to be. This time last year, a friend of mine here at our church was getting married, and a few days before the wedding, he invited a bunch of us to come out and play uh, soccer at an indoor soccer place near us. I show up, and the group that had been assembled was most of guys in their 20s, right? The age when you can just roll out of bed, you can show up, you can, you know, run around, play soccer for two hours, no problem. Basically, the age that I still think that I am in my mind. There were several of us from church that were there to uh, celebrate with this guy and to play soccer. And there were two other guys in particular who were there to play that I will say are, are slightly older than I am, okay? Mark and Scott are their names. They, they go to church here. Uh, these two, while being slightly older, infinitely smarter than I am because when we came time to pick which positions we were gonna play on the soccer field, what do you think my friends Mark and Scott decided would uh, be the best positions for them to limit the amount of running that they would need to do? Goalies, right? There's only two goalies. There were three old guys, and so Mark and Scott picked their positions, and so where did that leave me? I had to go out and give it a go, okay? So two goalies, three old guys. Old man Dan Reichel is out there. Gonna, you know, We started getting ready. I'm like doing stretches and jumping jacks and you know, old man stretching, and, and so we divide up into two teams, and I kid you not, 30 seconds into this start of this soccer game, they, they do like the first kick, and the ball starts coming in my direction, and I start to, to run backwards as the ball is coming toward me. In that moment, I audibly heard a loud pop sound, simultaneous to the most intense pain I've ever felt in my life. And women who have given uh, birth to children will say, dude, you have no idea what intense pain is like. And to that I say, you are absolutely correct, okay? But for me, this was the most intense pain I've ever felt. I found out later that afternoon, I tore my left calf muscle in half by jogging backwards, ladies and gentlemen, okay? I was, I was literally walking backwards. It was that sad. I limped over to like the side of the field. This game is literally like a minute old. And I'm, you know, waving everybody goodbye. Like, hey, you know, good game. I gotta go. It was a great time. Nick, congratulations on the wedding. And that was it. I was out. It's funny how humbling it can be when you think you have something mastered, when you think you have something under control, when you have in your mind how things are gonna go, and the reality is you're not as awesome as you think that you are, and things don't go maybe the way that you think they are going to go. Over the last several weeks, we've been in this uh, book of the Bible known as First Peter in this teaching series called Fight to the Finish. The whole idea behind this teaching series has been, as Peter says at the very beginning of the letter in chapter one, he says that for all of us, for, for me, for you, for his original audience, all of us, Peter is trying to get across to us this idea that we would, as it says in, in chapter one, verse six, greatly rejoice even though, he says, now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Rejoice, he says, for us to do even though your life for the moment is gonna be pretty difficult, which does not make any logical sense, does it? If you've ever read the Bible, if you've been to church, if you listen to, to sermons here or online, the idea of rejoicing, even though you're going through difficult times, is something that comes up in the Bible over and over again. And it goes against, at least in my opinion, what we naturally think we ought to do when we experience difficult messy, painful, confusing times in our lives. Rejoicing, being happy about it, is the last thing that we would ever want to do. I absolutely love the way that uh, it's described how Jesus interacted with his disciples in John chapter nine. Look at this. John chapter nine, it tells us, as Jesus went along, he saw a man who was born blind, blind from birth. 
Jesus' disciples come to him and they, they say, Rabbi, okay, tell us, explain to us. Who sinned so that this man is now blind? Was it his, his, the man himself or was it his parents? Whose fault is it, Jesus, that this is happening in this guy's life? And I love to picture the, the look on Jesus' face where he's like rubbing his forehead like a little bit and, and he's still, he's, he's smiling because he knows the truth that he's about to, to speak to his disciples and he's able to teach them in this moment. He tells them, guys, okay, great question. It's actually neither. Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened, this difficult time that this guy is facing happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. It is absolutely a raw deal that this guy was born this way, had an extremely difficult life, especially if you think about the first century and living in those conditions. What does Jesus do? He spits on the ground. He makes some mud with his saliva. He puts it on the man's eyes, tells him to go wash in this pool. And for the first time in this guy's life, he is given the gift of sight. And all of this happened as a way of showing that God has not forgotten him, that God is able to do incredible, miraculous things in our lives. Amen? We're not really much of an amen church, are we? There you go. All right, I'm, I'm gonna give everybody another chance, okay? So we're gonna rewind that back, and when I get to that point again, give me like your best, even if you have a mask on, the best amen, all right? This happened, we'll do it again. This happened, all right? This happened as a way of showing that God has not forgotten him and that God is able to do, guys, incredible, miraculous our lives. Amen? Yeah. Amen, yes, there you go, great job. Peter is like, listen, rejoice even though you're going through difficult times. The Apostle Paul says the same idea in Romans chapter five. He tells us not only this, guys, but listen, we need to rejoice in our sufferings knowing that there is good that's gonna come out of it. Knowing that our suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character gives us hope. Do you know what it's like to feel hope, right? Hope is one of the most beautiful emotions available to us in our human experience. And in a strange twist, if you think about it, without our sufferings, without our difficulties, without all the things that we carry around, the pain that we may have experienced in our lives, if you didn't know that, you would never know what it is to have hope in Jesus. Last week, our, uh, our groups and women's pastor, Lisa Jones, spoke. If you did not get a chance to watch her message, I cannot encourage you enough to make it a priority. Go back and watch that on our website. Just such great stuff. And Lisa's main idea last week was that we all have our own stories, don't we? We all have the story of, of highs and lows in our lives and that God has not forgotten us, the things that he has seen us through and all of that. And her, her main point was that it's so important for us to both know our story and then not just keep it to ourselves, but to share our stories as well. To take time to think about and realize how God has been with us throughout and then share that. I guarantee there's somebody in your life who could use the encouragement of the story of what God has done and is doing in your life. It's just what he does. If you have a story that you think, you know what, maybe, maybe this might be a good story that I'd like to share, on our website, our church's website, if you go to ccvlive.com slash stories, there's a place where you can share those just with us, the pastors here on staff, and let us know maybe about a way that you can see God has been at work or that he's working, and who knows, maybe that's a story that we share at some point. Today, as we wrap up this series, I want to look at this section at the very end of the book of 1 Peter, five chapters. In 1 Peter chapter five, if you have your Bible, if you have the CCV mobile app, you can look on there. It'll be on the screen for you as well. Look what Peter says. 1 Peter chapter five, starting in verse five, he addresses, again, all of you, every single one of us, no one is exempt. All of you, clothe yourselves 
with humility toward one another. Why? Because God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, and then cast all your anxiety on him, on Jesus, because he cares for you. Fashion question, okay? On a scale from one to 10, how good of a dresser would you say that you are, okay? Maybe your number is different than the number that the person sitting next to you would say that you are, right, okay? Maybe you're like, dude, I'm like a two, okay? I don't even wear matching socks most of the time. I have the same three shirts and I rotate through. Maybe you're like, I'm a nine. I'm a fashion icon, okay, somewhere on that scale. It's always funny to look back on old photos of yourself, right, from like the 80s and 70s if if you were alive and, and see like how fashion has changed over the years. I found this picture of myself from when I was in elementary school and I am so looking forward to the day when white turtlenecks and cardigans come back into style, okay? Yes. Now, I guarantee my hair will never be that long again, okay? Sorry, sorry for the bad news there, but absolutely, right? Fashions change, and yet this idea of clothing yourselves is a metaphor, if you, if you look, that comes up over and over again in the Bible. I love it. Look, Job chapter 40, Old Testament. Job, it says, We're told to adorn ourselves, what? With glory and splendor, Job chapter 40, verse 10. Adorn yourselves with glory and splendor and clothe yourselves, here's this idea, okay? Clothe yourself with honor and majesty. Like put those on in the same way you would put on a shirt and a white turtleneck and a cardigan, okay? Wear those as if you would wear clothing so that when people look at you, that's that's the impression that they get, In the book of Colossians, New Testament, the Apostle Paul, same exact metaphor. He's like, guys, look at this wardrobe, okay? Therefore, you, as as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, put on all of these clothes. Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Like, just layer yourselves in all of these. It makes me think of, if you ever watched the TV show Friends, when Joey goes in and and he puts on all of Chandler's clothes, like, like his roommates, like clothing, like could I be wearing any more clothes, right? Just put all of this on. If you are a follower of Jesus, all of these should be what people think of and what they see when they look at your life. And just like whatever shoes you have on today, whatever shirt, pants, clothing, whatever, whatever you have on, you chose to put that on today, All of these characteristics are things that we are able to choose. If you think about over the past few weeks, if if you're on social media, on Facebook, wherever, have you clothed yourself in humility in the way that you have posted on Facebook or responded or commented on something? Have you worn that, as Peter says, garment of humility? Have you clothed yourself in that? As you look forward for, let's just say, let's just limit it to the next 10 days. As you are planning to comment on social media and and post and share things and articles and whatever, are you doing it in such a way that people would say, you know what, yeah, I can tell. That person is clothed in humility. All of you clothe yourselves in humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, everybody, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. And here's where it all transitions, okay? You can choose to be humble or not humble, but all of us struggle with anxiety. And Peter tells us, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 2020 has been a pretty easy year, yeah? Right? Pretty, pretty laid back. No, this has been like the most dramatic year in most of our lives for all different kinds of reasons. Anxiety and uncertainty. Did you know that there's an asteroid that's supposed to hit Earth next week? Did you know this? Okay. If you didn't, sorry to like give you extra anxiety, but that's supposed to happen. It's supposed to be small, but you know, all these uncertain things that are going to happen in our future cause us to be anxious. And the real question is how much of your anxiety have you casted onto 
Jesus. Can I be honest with you about my answer? Not enough. Not enough. I take on the things that make me anxious. I carry them myself. I try to find ways to fix them, to cope with them, to deal them, to explain them away, to just bury them deep inside. We all have different ways that we deal with things that make us anxious. And Peter's telling us, listen, you have to just learn to cast those anxieties onto him. You ever uh, go to bed at night and forget to charge your cell phone? And then you wake up in the morning and you, and you realize, oh gosh, I gotta get out the door. And you, and you check and your phone only has like 15% battery. And you're not gonna be near a charger maybe. And so throughout the morning, you're watching the, the battery life just shrink down from 15 to 10. Am I the only one or do you guys do this too, okay? Right, 10 and then you're, you're down at like 2% and you're lowering the screen brightness and you're just like hanging on for dear life and it gets down to 1%. And then what happens when you finally find a charger? It changes everything, doesn't it? It's like the light from heaven shines down and you're, you just watch that, that beautiful battery life just bloom and it's, it's like you know, you're on your way back to happiness and, and normalcy. And in the same way, how drained do we feel when we try to keep things managed on our own? We try to make the plans and, and fix things and do things our own way Peter's saying, Jesus is telling us, guys, you're doing it wrong if you're trying to do it by yourself. After his resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples and he tells them these words. He says, guys, listen, okay, I, yes, I, the last couple of days, traumatic. You watched me be crucified. You, you thought I was dead and gone. I am back from the dead, Jesus says. And he tells them, do not let your hearts be troubled you guys, you have proven to me that you believe in God. Jesus is saying, believe in me also. And then he, he offers them a deal. He says, listen, my peace, I, I'm going to leave my peace with you. My peace, Jesus says, I give to you. I'm, I'm giving you this peace. I don't give to you as the world gives. I'm not like trying to... to benefit myself or, or manipulate you. Jesus is literally saying, give me your burdens, give me your anxiety, and I will give you my peace. Don't let your hearts be my peace. Be troubled and do not be afraid. I just know that over the last, even just let's say month, there have been times where I, and I guarantee you, have felt like your heart has been troubled. You have been, you maybe right now in this moment are afraid of what the rest of this afternoon is gonna look like, what this week is gonna look like. You have this, this fear of what the future is going to look like. And all of that, we have the opportunity to cast onto Jesus, to give to him and in exchange receive his peace. Do you like roller coasters? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. I, I don't like the pirate ship ride, you know the pirate ship that like rocks back and forth, okay? Not a fan of that one. I don't like the spinny rides where like you're like pressed up against the wall and like you could feel the vomit coming up, okay, not a fan of that one. But I, I love regular roller coasters, the, you know, the ones that go up and this is how roller coasters work, up and down and you know, swerve, even upside down is great. And there are, there are two kinds of people who like, who ride roller coasters, aren't there? First of all, there's people that don't ride roller coasters. If that's you, more power to you, okay? But if you, if you are somebody who subjects yourself to the, the roller coaster experience, there are two kinds of people. There are those who, when you get over the hill and they put their hands up and they're loving life and there are people who hang on for dear life and are convinced that they are not going to survive this ride, okay? And in the same way, as we go through the cheesiest metaphor, but the roller coaster of 2020 in our lives, unexpected turns and upside downs and all of that, you do not have to hold on with fear. You do not have to be afraid. You do not have to pretend like you are, you are doing this on your own and navigating this by yourself because Jesus is saying to us, 
cast that anxiety, that fear onto me. And, and when your hands are freed from the bar, when, when you release that anxiety, you'll notice that actually there, there are some pretty cool gifts that you still have in your hands. And I'm not minimizing the anxiety, guys. Trust me. I mean, there are all kinds of things that are genuinely worth worrying about. Kids going back to school, where you're going to live, where your next paycheck is going to come from, health stuff. I, I understand. I experience. I know all of it. But the problem is when we think that we have to do this on our own, it cycles down and cycles down to this this point where we're like, I don't even know what it looks like, Jesus, to give you my life. And the beauty is that we can at any moment, in a word, in a phrase, in a a second, we can say, Jesus, please take this and show me what is still in my hands. Okay, you're not left empty-handed if you let go, but there are actually, there are lots of things you still have in your hands. Peter explains it this way in 1 Peter 4, go back one chapter. He says, each of you, okay, You should use whatever gift that you have received to serve other people as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. That you have been given gifts that will enable other people to see that God is still at work in their lives. And it might not look the way that you think it is. Like you might think, okay, I'm on this track, I'm on this path, I've put so much time and energy into this thing, that I, you know, my life that I've created, and what happens when that flips? What happens when I'm like, you know what? That isn't the right path that I was supposed to be on. Maybe there's, there's something else that God wants me to do. If you've ever thought that, if you've ever felt like, maybe this isn't it, I wanna finish with this quick story. Tony Campolo was a, a former professor at Eastern University here in Philadelphia, and he tells about a friend of his named Charlie, and he tells about a friend who quit his job teaching English literature to college. One day, Tony says, you got a call from Charlie's mother and and she was like, Tony, you have to do something. Charlie, your friend Charlie, quit his job. He has a PhD in English literature, but if he does not teach, Tony, I don't know what he is going to do with his life. And Tony's like, that's a great question. What do you do if you have a PhD in English and you're not teaching? So Tony Campolo goes to visit his friend. He was, this guy, Charlie, was living in an apartment in New Jersey. He walks in and Charlie's like, come on in, sit down, sit down, it's fine. And with like a, a Buddha-like smile, it says, Charlie goes, Tony, I quit. I just quit. I gave up and I quit teaching. Campolo goes, I, I, Charlie, I know this. Why, why, <laughs> why did you quit? And Charlie said, I can't do it, man. I can't teach. I cannot teach these people any longer. Every time I used to walk into that class, Charlie said, I would give a lecture and I would die a little bit in the inside. I know that this is not what I was made for. I know that this is not what I'm supposed to do with my life. Tony says to Charlie, says, okay, well, then what are you going to do now? And Charlie says, oh, I've already got this figured out. I've already, you have, I haven't seen it in a little bit, but I've, I've chosen a new path for myself, Tony. I, Charlie, am now a mailman. And Tony says, terrific, a PhD mailman, excellent. And Charlie's like, yeah, there's not that many of us that have that career path, right? Tony doesn't try to change his mind, but he says, all right, Charlie, if you're gonna be a mailman, you have to be the best mailman that you can possibly be. And Charlie looks at him and says, you know what? Honestly, I am, I've been doing this for a little bit, I am the world's worst mailman. I am terrible at this, Tony. I cannot do this either. And he's like, what do you mean you're, you're terrible? He's like, well, it's, it's great, but everybody else gets their mail delivered by like one, two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm out here and I am still delivering mail at 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30 at night. And Tony's like, what? What is taking you so long? Charlie goes, I visit, I stop, and when I'm delivering the mail, I also spend time with the people that I'm taking the mail to, that I, you know, I show up, and, and you know, sometimes it's, it's somebody who hasn't had a conversation with a live person in weeks, and, and I just stay, and I do, and I can't, I can't sleep, Tony, I can't sleep, and Tony's like, why? He's like, dude, 
Who could sleep after drinking 20 cups of coffee? I have to keep going all day to just keep this. The mail is out there, but I'm also helping people and, and doing all this. And Tony says that he, he began to imagine his friend Charlie out there as the most extraordinary mailman you can ever imagine. Going door to door, helping people, visiting solitary widows and, and joking with people who haven't had human interaction. That this is the only mailman who you can ever say when he has a birthday, the people on his route go out, rent out a gym and have a party for him. That they love him so much and in his own way, this guy Charlie has let go of the anxiety, let go of the expectations on himself and that he felt like people had on him and just simply started to love people. We have a choice, don't we? You have a choice. You are about to start a brand new week. Maybe some of you, a brand new season of life. You are about to go into the, un an asteroid is gonna hit the earth next week, guys, okay? Uncertainty is around every corner. We have no idea what the future holds. All kinds of trials are guaranteed to come your way over the next several weeks. And when those arrive, because they are going to arrive, when the difficult season sets in, when you feel like you're not sure where to go or what to do or where to turn, and you've tried to solve the equation on your own, in those moments, you need to release the anxiety, cast all of those fears onto Jesus and allow him to give you his peace. Let's pray. God, there is nothing more scary than, than heading into seasons in our lives where we are unsure of what the next step is supposed to be when we're fearful of how a situation is gonna turn out, when we're afraid of the unknown. God, our prayer today is that you would give us your peace. That we would learn as natural as it is for us to get dressed in the morning, to clothe ourselves with the humility that comes from knowing that you are in control. I pray, God, that you would help us to let go of the things that we have no control over in the first place and to allow you to give us that comfort. We pray these things in Jesus' name.